Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Connie Chang. I'm the commissioner for ANC 34G uh, District 5, single member district number five. I'm welcoming you to our ninth uh, ANC 34G hosted information exchange session. This is a series of sessions, and this is the ninth one. And the title of it is uh, Delivering Affordable Housing Using an Equity Lens. What does it mean to design buildings and to provide resident services with equity in mind? What practices and ideas can we borrow that's compatible with a reimagined civic core in Chevy Chase, D.C.? So those of you who've come and attended uh, before, you know that this series is matched up with the Chevy Chase Small Area Plan, which began in FY 2021. Uh, on March 14th, the draft uh, Chevy Chase Small Area Plan was released by the Office of Planning, and um, they are asking for public comments uh, by May 13th. You know, during this whole time that we've been discussing the plan and before the draft of the plan came up, we've been providing certain sessions um, to inform the community on topics of interest. And so this is the ninth one. Um, we uh, really welcome all of you to uh, go take a look at that plan. It's at um, publicinput.com forward slash Chevy Chase. You can find uh, that draft plan there, that the PDF version, or you can go to the Chevy Chase Neighborhood Library or the Chevy Chase Community Center at the ANC 34G uh, resource table to get a hard copy. Um, Please note that next Tuesday, there's a public hearing that the Office of Planning is hosting that will take place at the Chevy Chase Presbyterian Church, which is one uh, Chevy Chase circle, starting at 2 p.m. All this information is on our website at uh, anc3g.org. So please go there. Um, after that uh, public hearing, they will post all uh, testimonies, the transcript of, of that hearing onto the same public input.com forward slash Chevy Chase, uh, which is what uh, we asked, the commission asked them to do. So you'll be able to see people's testimonies. Um, that uh, transcript, as well as all written comments that are submitted to the Office of Planning by May 13th, uh, will be uh, submitted to the council when they will review the final uh, plan and um, vote on a resolution. So uh, the commission is, uh, we're gearing up to draft our own resolution um, by, uh, to be discussed publicly by May 11th and to get this, draft. That, that's our next public meeting after the one that's coming up, but May 11th before the 13th and um, to uh, have a draft plan, uh, draft, sorry, resolution available a week before that. So anyway, with no further ado, I hope I gave you some background. You could always look at the website for more for all of the other topics we've covered so far. There are the, all the video recordings are there and the Q&A and chat log is there. I would like to now introduce our panelists by just saying their names, but have them uh, give their own introduction. So Kia Weatherspoon is, uh, is determined by design. She's the founder. Carmen Romero and Mitch uh, Crispell is at APA, and they will introduce themselves and say their names properly and all of that. And so we'll get to know them. And then Mitch will start with his presentation, then Kia. So to you, Kia, thank you so much. Ah, thank you, Connie. Thank you very much, Charles, Peter. Um, thank you all for having me. Happy Thursday. Um, my name is Kia Weatherspoon. I'm the president and founder of Determined by Design. Um, and Something I'm really proud of, and in the moment, I kind of glossed over it when it happened, but on February 2nd, 2022, I retired from the Air Force with 21 years of service. Um, and that's important primarily because it is the military that led me to interior design. Um, and this ethos we'll talk about later this evening around design equity. Well, that's a hard act to follow, but I will try. Carmen Romero, I'm president and CEO at APA. Um, I've worked at APA for the last 11 years, but I've uh, been in DC for over 25 years since I graduated from Georgetown in undergrad. Um, I have um, two things I wanna tell you about myself that I, I think really drive me in my work. Um, first, I'm a Latina immigrant. My parents immigrated here from Columbia in the late 1960s um, and really lived the American dream. And I want to try to replicate that for so many of the families that call APA home and giving opportunity 
to the, the folks that, that live in our properties. And I'm also a mom. I have three kids, um, college, high school, and middle school. And I very much believe in a two-generation approach when it comes to housing. And um, love, love that you've been inviting us to, to participate tonight. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Mitch. Hi, everybody. Mitch Crispell. I'm a director of real estate development at APA. And um, what I want to tell you about myself is that I grew up on Brookville Road, uh, just across Western Avenue from y'all. And I got all my toys at Child's Play. We used to get videos at the basement store, went to Pumpernickel's with my dad on Sundays, although I guess it's closed now, um, had birthday parties at the diner, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of uh, experience in your neighborhood, really love it and really excited to be speaking with you tonight. Um, and but I've been with APA for about 18 months. And before that, I was in San Francisco for five years doing affordable housing development. So we're gonna show you a little presentation um, and Carmen's gonna kick us off. Okay, thanks, Mitch. Um, you can jump ahead if you don't mind. There you go. Um, so APA's mission is threefold. We're more than a, a real estate developer. Um, the first part is to preserve affordable housing in the region, as well as to build new high quality affordable homes. But we couple the housing with services that are in the buildings to give both opportunity and stability to residents once they move in. And lastly, we wanna be part of public policy discussions because you know, as a region, we're not gonna build our way out of our affordability crisis alone as APA. We've gotta be part of that bigger ecosystem around what are the tools um, and conversations we need to be having. So um, if you move ahead, Mitch, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about us. So we're a 30 year old nonprofit developer. We own 2000 apartments, all rentals. But we have 1,400 in active pre-development, um, as well as five projects under construction today that I'll tell you about in a minute. Where we focus, our sweet spot is in the 30% AMI to 60% AMI, um, which are the majority of our families are working families that have essential worker positions in this region. We're talking about nannies and people who work in transportation and nurses aides and grocery workers and retail and hospitality. Our average income is $40,000 in our households. Um, but 10% of our units are set aside for permanent supportive housing partnerships. Those might be folks that are in a program um, that requires that they need additional assistance to live independently. It might be um, kids on the autism spectrum living um, for the first time on their own with an aid. It could be um, someone that has, you know, a veteran that's disabled, but you'll hear more about that from some of the project examples that Mitch is gonna take you through later. Um, we are th in five jurisdictions, even though our name is your own to partnership for affordable housing, we're gonna be going through a rebranding a little bit later because we are now serving the broader DC area in five jurisdictions today. And we are deeply committed to racial justice. So what is affordable housing? And many of you probably know um, a lot about this already. I know you guys have been on a learning journey as, as, a, as a group for a while now, but affordable housing is income restricted housing for folks making 60% and below the area median income for the, for the most part on average. In DC, that area median income is incredibly high. We're a victim of our own success as a region. You know, the median income in the DC area is I think 142,000 today. So that means an individual can make up to like 55,000 as, as one person and be considered, you know, uh, affordable housing eligible. Um, and we're renting up buildings today for, for people that are, you know, in anywhere else in America might be considered middle income, um, but in the DC area, because our averages are so high and because our cost of housing is so high, they're really priced out. And I said before, most are working families. We have many seniors, or in fact, a lot of our portfolio now in the suburbs, especially in Loudoun and in Fairfax, is serving the senior population on a fixed income. Um, how do we, you know, but I think one thing that distinguishes APA is we are very committed to building affordable housing in areas of opportunity. You will never find APA building in areas that don't have access to good food, to transit, to jobs. Um, to me, that's central 
to where do it's where do we want to build affordable housing? And I'm so excited that that your ward has invited us to have this conversation because I, I think you're a perfect place to put affordable housing and access to all the rich amenities that you have in your community. Um, in terms of common concerns around property values and are, are our buildings attractive, I invite anyone to come across the river and see some of the work we're doing in Arlington County. We are building our, our most recent building that we just opened in Roslyn, Queens Court. Our views are our $3 million condos that are built across the street, facing a beautiful new school that was designed um, by an architect. It's a public school that was designed by an architect um, out of Copenhagen Big. Beautiful buildings, you would look at it and not be able to distinguish our building from a market rate building. Um, and we pride ourselves on that. We think that's an important element of, of what we're putting forward is beautiful high quality housing, which is why we are actually working with Kia and you'll hear more about our partnership with Kia on our latest project. And we can talk all night about how we finance it it's very complex, but people like Mitch are brilliant and do it every day. And there are incredible tools that the federal government has called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. It's a bipartisan program that's been around since the 80s. That's the equity, there's permanent debt, and there's always gap funding. And that's where really DC leads the nation in their investment in providing low interest loans to fill that gap and make the numbers possible. So Mitch, I'm gonna turn it over to you to show them some. Oh, actually, before I do that, I guess I'm gonna um, quickly run through I already talked about the fact that we have five buildings under construction today, and then the building we just um, delivered. But, um, and you know, you'll know, you see a lot of our pipeline, and you're gonna get some better examples from Mitch, are partnering with local governments on, to work on public land, um, partnering with religious institutions, houses of worship, um, partnering, taking our own land through a rezoning to get more density. And it's because it's impossible for us to compete with, them, with, with market forces to secure land. So a big opportunity for us are when RFPs come or when there's an opportunity for us to give an unsolicited proposal to a church that's open to doing mission. Um, and with that, I will now pass it over to me. Great, thank you. So I wanna just highlight three projects that, um, we, that are recent. So the first is our first project in DC. It's over near the Fort Totten Metro Station at the intersection of Riggs Road and South Dakota Avenue Northeast. Um, and it's a partnership with EYA. They're building the townhomes next adjacent and where they had a requirement to have put an affordable, uh, use some of the land for an affordable housing development. So they brought us into the team. And so this is just a you know, mock-up of what it will look like, but it's 93 units for seniors. Um, a portion of those units will be for permanent supportive housing people that are coming out of homelessness. And there's a whole separate program funded by a different department in the city will provide intensive case management services to them. We have a services partner that will work with us. So they will really be taken care of and you know, provided um, all the needs that they have beyond housing will be addressed through that uh, case manager. And then we also make sure that in our senior buildings and all of our buildings, we provide a lot of amenity spaces so that they, the projects really become a community. We've got some pictures of those on the next slide. Um, I wanted to give two examples of kind of a co-location. I know you all are thinking a lot about the Chevy Chase Library and Rec Center. So here's kind of some examples of how we've done similar things in the past to kind of get you thinking. Um, so the Arlington Presbyterian Church uh, approached us because they uh, their membership had been going down and they wanted to use their land to kind of further their faith mission of providing affordable housing. And we worked with them to redevelop their site into 173 units of affordable housing, including a ground floor space for them to stay on site. So, you know, they, they took their, their land that was just a church and now it's a mixed use project with uh, lots of uh, housing. Uh, they're still there as the church. And then we also have a really cool uh, business, small business incubator, La Cocina VA, um, that helps people start businesses as chefs. Um, so this is a really successful example of kind of how you do that. And then the second one we wanted to highlight is with one with the American Legion post 139, same story. They had an old building and a big parking lot and they wanted to redevelop it and have a nicer space for themselves and then also get affordable housing above. So uh, here's the rendering and then here's what it really looks like now because it's almost done construction. Um, and this one is 160 units. We're, it's in a fantastic neighborhood in Arlington, lots of amenities like Carmen was saying, and we're gonna be bringing this online soon. And something that we tried to do here in, in all of our projects is make sure the interiors were really excellent so that people, and Kia will get into this more, but here is Kia's 
design realized. Um, and like Carmen said, I mean, if you walked into this, you wouldn't know you're in an affordable housing building. I mean, it's beautiful. And so that's what we, we think that our residents deserve that dignity of living in a beautiful space. Um, so there's a couple examples of kind of how we've taken, you know, sm small low density uses and then preserved those uses, made them much nicer than they were before and added a bunch of affordable housing on top. And I guess the one thing I'll add there too, we really try to respond to the context of what our partner in the community wants. And in that case, since we were partnering with American Legion, it really mattered to them to be able to house veterans. So we put in place a 50% veterans preference for the first time in the Commonwealth of Virginia's history. And I'm proud to report that as of today, we have our first veterans lease signed as the first person. Um, and it's, you know, when we open up a new building of affordable housing and opportunity areas like this, for 150 units, we may get, and I think we already have 2000 people on, on the interest list. So when we kind of craft a preference like that um, in response to the needs of our partner, it goes a long way. And we really try to approach every project differently. Um, I guess you can keep going forward. And then the last piece um, Mitch and I want to touch on is, and I mentioned this at the front, our mission is more than building the building. That's just the start. You know, we're, we're here, when we commit to affordable housing, it's in perpetuity. They're gonna be part of our community. People live in our homes. They're on average, I think the average is like eight years in our portfolio right now once they move in. And we wanna make sure that the time they spent there is infused with opportunity and stability. And we have a resident services group that's led by masters in social work that we recruited from the University of Ann Arbor um, a year ago. And we staffed him up from a team of four to now a team of 14 of social work type of individuals, coordinators that are on site that can access and create partnerships and programs around health and wellness, around workforce and economic mobility, around after school tutoring, around access to daycare. Um, we're, we're launching programs, two pilots that we're doing now is an IDA program so people can set their own goals. We don't set goals for people. They decide for themselves. Do I want to buy a home? Do I want to start a business? Do I want to get um, a certain certification to increase my earning potential? So we're creating cohorts like that. We have girls on the runs teams. We have Girl Scouts. We have access to travel soccer programs that we're just launching. We want all the same opportunities that my kids have for APA kids to have. And we fundraise to do that. And we also take our developer fee and invest it in doing that. So unlike a market rate part uh, developer that has to use that to pay returns, ours is reinfused into the service arm so that we make sure that our residents are thriving. Um, and I think there's maybe a couple more, but I know I might be taking us over time, but eviction prevention is at the core of what we do as well. I'm very proud to say we extended the eviction moratorium um, to December of last year, and we've managed to work with everyone to get um, people access to rent relief tools if they want to avail themselves of it. And um, we know it's going to be hard coming out of COVID. A lot of our federal programs are going to be going away. It's going to be much tougher to keep everyone housed because we don't have all the same tools, but we're going to really work hard to do that as coming out of the pandemic. And we did things like on-site vaccination clinics and others, which, which during um, COVID were really important to break down barriers. So our residents don't always need to go out and wait in lines to get help we can bring help to them. And we always have community rooms designed in a multi-purpose way so that we can house partners to come in and bring. Um, but I think that we're gonna end it there so that we can pass it over to Kia. Great, and for the hey. audience, for the attendees, just please put your questions in the Q&A and then uh, after Kia's presentation, we'll, I'll read them out. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Thank you all. Carmen, Mitch, thank you. Um, you know, Carmen and Mitch already alluded to the fact that um, we are partners um, and at Determined by Design to do the work that we do. Um, language is a big part, a big part of our ethos, right? Um, and when you think about an interior designer and affordable housing, you're like, how do they go hand in hand, right? Because there's this assumption that interior design is a luxury for a few um, and for spaces to be equitable, elevated interior spaces have to be a standard for all. Um, and for us to do that, we have to have partners who are willing to do the work. Um, we have to have partners who will allow us to stretch them 
Um, we have to have partners who will help, who allow us to understand their pain points when it's a finance entity that won't allow them to have the elevated finishes, right? How do we find that middle ground? Um, because at the end of the day, for us, design equity is about creating a empathetic and concept-based design approach for equitable design outcomes for Black, Indigenous, and other minority peoples and communities, right? So I talked briefly about my military story. Um, and I share that story because I came to realize my space mattered by going into two extreme environments, war and prisons, to visit, visit my brother who was incarcerated for 15 years, right? And Carmen touched on this briefly when she said she wants APA residents to grow up in the same type of spaces that her kids do, right? So a lot of what we do is about empathy, right? This idea of are the spaces that we are creating something we would want for our loved ones. So sometimes when you can't see yourself in that community, it's really hard for some of our development partners to understand, mm, we need a story here. We need a concept. We need the context. It's not what's the trend. It's what's the story of the people of a community that's woven into the fabric of what we do. So I, you will hear me say this at nauseum. Our concepts, our process is what drives us, right? And when you talk about, when you think about the definition of a concept, it's about a plan, but really it's about intention. So with intention for us at Determined by Design, it is about creating an equitable design concept. And it's the creation of elements, spaces, and materials translated from historical community context that connects the design to the people story. Um, I am in the business of people, all people. Um, one of the things that we often talk about at Determined by Design is there's the site, which is man-made, and there, then there is the land, right? Who owned that land before it was a site, right? Because for us, it's the lineage of that passing of land to site from owner to owner. It's the lineage of those communities and that historical context that always has to be prevalent to really fuel the design decisions that we make. So this is a big part of our process. And I think, I don't think I know, this is what makes us different from other design firms. Um, we are often looking for the people's story, not the trend, um, not contemporary, not modern, um, when we're rooted in the context of a community stories, which every single community story is rich, then we're able to really weave in um, elements and features that are specific to this community. So we do it from a historical context. Um, we look for the community story, story local vernacular, people, um, legacy, art, music, business. Who are the ancestors? Who are the people that cultivated the community where we exist and where we live and how do we pay homage to them? We also look to nature. Um, when we think about things like the, you know, the indigenous lands, streams, the, you know, parks and recreations, how do we take all of those elements and those contextual things from nature? How do we weave them into our design process? We look for innovation and fashion trends. Right? What's happening in fashion? How do we bring this elevated um, garments, textiles, jewelries, accessories, and also this idea of ceremony? Right? When we talk about the story of communities from, from past and these indigenous stories, there's always a ceremony in some culture. Right? Culture is about ceremonies and adornment. So we look to fashion and these elements still to weave into our design process. So I want to walk you through very quickly. Um, one of our projects where you can start to see in action what I just explained. This is a project in DC. It's in the A Street cor Corridor. It's called Parcel 42. Um, like Apple, all of our projects are affordable low-income housing. Um, that is the work we choose to do at Determined by Design. That is probably about 90% of our project type. Um, it is very intentional. So this particular project, it had the history um, if you know anything about the A Street Corridor of jazz, music, scholars, Duke Ellington. So it was really this Black history and her story that we really wanted to elevate. Um, A Street Corridor used to be known as the Black Broadway with music, arts, and expressions. Um, it was this, no, this idea of a, like a Black renaissance and excellence. Um, it was the voice of culture and prosperity. So when we do this, we're doing this deep dive in this research. This is where it becomes that we begin to, um, as our vice president, Sequoia Hunter-Suje likes to say, 
This is where we write our, our love story or a poem to our partner, to the community. This is kind of like a prayer of intention based off of all this contextual information, which leads up to our concept statement, marks of a triumphant crest, right? The statement, the imagery is supposed to evoke this feeling, not, you know, Pantone's color of the year is evergreen frost, right? It's what's the fabric? How do we then translate that through imagery, this wordplay, this research and this history? And then we create these color stories that are indicative to the narrative of that space. That is where the historical context comes into play. Um, and we weave that all the way through to the materiality, right? Where we start to see the gold textures and elements and the ornateness of markings. Uh, we start to see the crescendos of a crest, right? So we're going back to those words. And this is where we shine as a design firm. We're also at this juncture thinking about pricing. Pricing, 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 pricing transparency. How do we get elevated products, materials, and textures into our design projects? We advocate for transparency through our, with our development partners. Sometimes that ruffles the feathers of our general contractors and our GCs. Um, but at the end of the day, we are in service to the community and creating an elevated design outcome for everyone. That is why it's critical to what we do um, we think about ways to partner with local artists and makers. This kind of design element that you see on the back wall is by an architect named Mark Michael Ford. And he's known as the hip hop architect, architect. And what he's done is he allows kids to make music and then the beat of the music is into these custom wall coverings. So now we're bringing the voice and the music and the words of the next generation into the context of a design in a community that was all about the musicality and some of the musical rates, right? So this is how we start to make these design decisions um, based solely off history and context. This process is exactly similar to what we did with APA. Um, and I think this is when we talk about being, we stretch our partners and they being receptive. Um, I, we say it hands down, um, they get it. They app it, gets it, they, they're willing to do the work, they're willing to be stretched. And one of the things that I loved about, this was our main lobby space in the building that they show you that will be furnished in a few weeks, I'm excited. Um, but this space for us, you know, we knew their pain point of needing to have a lobby space that soft seating really wasn't gonna work, but they still wanted an approach that will allow a mom and her kids, if she's waiting for an Uber to have a place to perch, they still wanted to have a place, an elevated lobby experience. So we did this integrated platform seating with these cushions, right? Then we kind of finessed it a little bit more and we did this barrel seating and these, these, um, these green planter box, but it was a dialogue, right? It was about assessing their pain points as, as what they know from when the building turns over, but then still also integrating elevated design and light fixtures um, with little to no VE. That's what we pride ourselves on at the Turn by Design. Um, if you are not familiar with the term value engineering, it's kind of like your parents give you an allowance and then you go to um, Saks Fifth Avenue and they're like, what are you doing shopping there? You need to go to Target. That is value engineering. Um, but we try to make sure every finish, texture, element stays elevated. Um, and this yumminess of decorative light fixtures in this community room. And they also talked a lot about how they need amenity space and programming space. So how do we create furniture packages that allow them to do both, right? It's this idea of elevated materials, that really can capture the essence of a property, um, but also the practicality of what they need all through this lens of elevated and amazing design. And I'm gonna stop us there um, to be respectful of our time. Well, wow, thank you so much uh, for both of you, um, both meaning all three of you uh, for this excellent presentation. There's just so much, um, just richness and depth. I, I don't even, I think we should probably start with APA uh, to ask a, a few more questions about how you do your work. So I'm very interested in the resident services 
And I want to know how does that happen? Like you offer it and those who uh, decide to sign that lease, do you help them with the rent? Uh, how to you know, make the rent payments? How do you engage initially? How does this happen in the process? Um, so right when someone moves in, we have a resident service coordinator meet them at the time of lease signing. And we usually have a gift or something to incentivize them to come in a big welcome basket with, you know, kitchen things and towels or whatever. And we spent about a half hour learning about their story. You know, mm. um, what, what do you do for a living? What ages are your kids if you have kids? Do you have health care? Um, are you looking to change jobs? And just, we go through, it's like a six page intake survey and that helps us design, okay, what should the services package look like for that particular building. And then we know kind of who we should hire as a coordinator, who we should move over. That would be great to work with seniors or maybe they're better with Latinx youth, depending on the profile. And then we, you know, obviously some of it depends on the demographics too. Mm -hmm. And then we um, pull together, uh, you know, a, a plan that has, that looks like a calendar. You walk into our properties, you'll see what's going on on a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Saturday or a Sunday night, and then we figure out what partners already exist in that community that we should be leveraging and talking to. Because most areas have existing, maybe what's the best food bank in that part of the district? Right. And come in and bring in hot meals. Who is the, the best after-school tutoring group that would love to you know, be in an MOU with APA that we can use some of our philanthropic money to compensate them for coming in and doing after-school tutoring for our third to fifth graders that have had learning loss during COVID. So it's very intentional and it should, and it needs to be resident informed by what the true need is, not us at corporate making it up. Well, you know, it's amazing. You said that you hired a master's, a person with a master's degree, right, from Ann Arbor. I'm thinking, you know, University of Michigan, probably or Michigan State. And, um, and you went, it grew from a staff of four to 14. So clearly you're putting resources in, you're using your developers fees, you're saying, you know, for this, you're raising money to do this. Um, so it didn't, but it, it started just a few years ago then. It's not, you have a 30 year history. When did this start? And what, uh, what provoked this like huge increase in, in providing the resources for these services? I mean, the people power for, this, for these services. What was the um, impetus? We, we've been doing it for like 13 years in some way, shape, mm -hmm. in a very small way. And the mm -hmm. issue was, frankly, you know, we brought in this new leader who teaches in the School of Social Work in Ann Arbor, as well as in affordable housing there. And he arrived a year ago and, and he looked around and he said, you can't serve 4,000 people with four people. I need a big team. I need a bigger budget. We're going to do this right. And I was a new CEO. I just got, I've been at Apple 11 years. I was doing development, but I was just in my role. And the board said, what can we do to help you? I said, it's enough, we're building beautiful buildings, but I want to make sure we're investing in the services. And they were there. And we were, I mean, COVID changed our relationship with our residents. They needed us more than ever before. They were trapped in the buildings. They needed rent because a lot of their jobs were going away. So we were there for them. We had a, a chance to like, what are we going to do with this incredible relationship that we've built with our residents? Well, we're going to honor it by doubling down and investing and making sure we're, you know, we're giving real opportunities in our buildings. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful to hear. Um, I do want to ask another question. So, I mean, uh, audience, if you feel, if you want to probe more, please put your questions in, but I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is that I know that you've been doing rentals, right? This is predominantly uh, rental buildings. Um, talk to me a little bit about the rent to own. You know, there's been a, a, a lot of studies that shown that uh, generational wealth, the gap between uh, black Americans and others, you know, white Americans, let's say just this, the two, it's a big gap, you know, and the whole idea of ownership is, you know, a real sense of belonging, you know, and, and to be able to build wealth and to be able to pass wealth down, let's say, but also just to feel like you're not there temporarily and that your money is, is building something for your family. You're not just paying rent to someone else. Do you have um, ideas about that? What is the difficulty of, of, of owning uh, for affordable housing? 
Um, and, and we don't do it today, but we are very interested in exploring expand, expansion into home ownership tracks, whether, what, whether that looks like us helping people with down payment, building programs, credit building programs, and then partnering with someone who's building the single family homes. The, the biggest challenge is it's so expensive to get land in DC or in Arlington. But now that we're regional in Fairfax and Loudoun, in Montgomery County, it really opens the door for us. You know, we've been talking to a manufacturer that does um, single family home modular developer development in California, who's building a factory that opens in Virginia in six months that can give a mm. for a two bedroom house to be $124,000 a year all in. We were, we're looking for, could we do an innovative partnership like that where we do a pilot and show that it can be done and that we can have our residents or identify people that are ready to take that next step and then partner with them on the down payment to do it. So we are not there yet. My board has to approve us doing it. So I don't want to get ahead of my board. Yeah. Right. But, you know, we're doing a strategic plan and that's one of the big questions I'm trying to raise is I agree with you. I think generational wealth is built through home ownership and I'd love for us to play a role. I'm not sure what that role is quite yet. Okay. Um, Mitch, did you want to add anything to what Carmen is saying? Okay. I don't think so, thanks. Okay, great. Um, I want to jump in on that. Thank um, you. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dry read, but it's a good read. Um, the Color of Law, um, if you have not read that book, and I'm an interior designer, I'm like, why are you reading a book about redlining and the color of law, right? Um, and kind of it speaks to what you talked about, how developers, the U.S. government, um, redlining, not providing finances back in the 1940s and 50s, and how those, ap those actions and the implications of those things take five generations to undo five generations, right? So that's my generation right now. Um, and you have to think about this idea of home ownership. And I think, what does it look like? And, you know, for-profit developer, nonprofit developer, right? There are funding um, structures and limitations for any affordable housing developer to in, insert a for-profit component. Um, and this is where sometimes you have to look at what are the funding sources and or agencies? How are they crippling that path to home ownerships um, and the barriers that they are creating for developers like APA who would approach something from an innovative lens? So I think it's a, it's a, a both and not either or what can the developer do, but what does governmental agencies and policies and funding and financing do? Because that is where the problem itself started um, 50 plus years ago. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, my therapist says I like to ask, is that fair? Because I strive for fairness. <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. Fair. <laughs> well, you know, Carmen, you did mention your public policy work, right? Because it is the case that you can't do everything and it does take partner uh, partnerships and it does take um, a, a kind of thinking, right? If you have this goal in mind, there's a vision forward. How do you make that happen? And I think this is this is an important conversation to have, and it's important to bring people to the table to see what can be done. You know, can you apply some of those rental payments as a credit to owning at some point? Can you partner with, um, I don't know, community land trust? We have had them before. I mean, I, I, I there's many people trying to make this work. Um, but we definitely still need tax credits or money financing. I mean, it is it is not easy. Um, I do want to go back to Kia. I, I, you know, you talk about these extreme environments that you've been in. That's really shaped your thinking. And it was very interesting. You started with the Air Force. And I know a little bit about that story. But I think it is a powerful one about space and space and community and how you um, how your space affects you. So when you first uh, joined the Air Force and you um, you were living in that space they provided. Give us a little bit of that story. I want the community to know a little bit more yeah. about you and what drives um, you and, and yeah. how you came to, to, to actually start Determined by Design. Absolutely. I'm going to keep it short because I see two questions in the chat that I want to make sure yeah. we get to. But um, I, I joined the Air Force to get money for school um, and I ended up, I was a dancer, a ballet dancer, and then I got didn't get financial aid. And so when we joined the military, I thought I was going to get stationed on the East Coast over here at Andrews. I got stationed at Wichita, Kansas in July um, of, of, 20, of 2001. Um, and then a couple months later, September 11th happened and I was on my first of five deployments to the Middle East. 
Um, I was at Al Udid Air Base in Doha, Qatar, um, and it was a bare base, and it was in Tent City, and I was in a tent with about 14 other women, and I needed some privacy because I needed to cry. Um, it was my first time out of the country, my first time away from my family. So I took three sheets, hung it up on top of my tent, and I made three sheet walls. And that was the first space I ever created. And I bawled like a baby for 15 minutes. Um, and it was something about how that space healed me. It brought me comfort. It brought me solace. Um, back then, it wasn't about the fancy decorative finishes and things. It was just about the power of space. Um, so when I got out of the military, I was like, I want to do this thing where I create spaces for people. And I really, um, so I became an interior designer, but that path quickly took me down luxury hotels, market rate, luxury buildings. Um, and in doing that, I, you know, I, I kind of fell by the wayside because I knew design was something bigger than that. Um, and I did a nonprofit project for domestic violence survivors, 12 women and 32 children in Southeast DC, and they all looked like me. And they said, we don't need this. We don't, it doesn't matter to our space or our quality of life. Um, and I took them through the design process and it went from, we don't need this to I, someone would do this for us. I thought this was something I can only see on TV. Um, and when the space was finished, it was pretty. Um, but this woman said to me, Miss Kia, when I walked into this room, I realized change was possible for me. And that's when I realized that people who need access to well-designed spaces the most, they don't know they don't have it and they don't know they need it and they don't have an advocate for it. So that's what our entire practice is built around. But when it comes to affordable housing and this idea of nimbyism, right? I get why communities don't want it in their backyards because historically it's been ugly. It's been ugly, it's been less than. Um, I wouldn't want that in my backyard either. So my job is to make sure that people have access to elevated design because at the end of the day, no one should be able to, to tell the difference between the space I inhabit or Charles or Peter or you, Connie, based off of my socioeconomic standing. And I'm doing my job as a design professional and removing all the biases and all the labels that exist and just design for people, people in community and history and context. That's what we get to do. And I think it's my foundational story of making mm -hmm. sure people don't have to go through extremes um, to realize their space matters. And that starts with their homes, their units in that rental community that's mm -hmm. elevated for them to realize what is possible when they do find that path to home ownership. So that's where it starts. That is so powerful, you know, with Carmen saying that when you lease from APA, you know, there's someone who's there who cares about your story. I mean, a six page intake form, you know, it, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Like you're there listening and you're there trying to figure out how to bring resources to people and having um, a space where others feel cared for I think that's very powerful and I think that's very important. So thank you for sharing that, you know, personal stories, where we come from, you know, Carmen, you shared that your parents are from Colombia, right? Immigrants. These are, I mean, these are really powerful. This is, this is something that you, you look at and people who look like you or look like me, you know, there's, there's that element to it. Right. And we want to turn around and we want to help. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. There are some questions. I'm going to read them. Ah, this is, Andrea, thank you for asking this. I was going to say it, but thank you for asking. Does APA also build family-sized units? Okay. Um, and she said, not a question, but I am thrilled to hear you speak of equitable design and rejection of value engineering. Now, family-sized units, I did visit, okay, the American Legion building. So Mitch or Carmen, you guys should talk about it. I was so happy to physically see that and I'm not going to give it away, but you guys talk about that 160 yeah, minutes. Can how many are family yeah. size? How many are family size? Yeah, so our kind of standard mix for our family projects in Virginia is 20% one bedroom, 60% two bedrooms, and 20% three bedrooms. We find that the two bedrooms are the most in demand. Um, and but yeah, the three bedrooms are really hard to find on the on the market for folks. So that's why it's really important that we're providing some of those in our affordable projects. Um, and at Terwilliger, I mean, I think we, I don't know the exact unit mix, but I think we do have a good number of uh, larger units there. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, I went to see, I mean, just for full disclosure, I did tour that building and I did meet a lot of your resident services staff. They're really fun people, really nice. We shared ele the elevator together, a little bit concerned about, because it's not open yet. So we were like, or will we be able to go all the way, you know, up yeah. a few flights and come back down safely. Um, but I did see the rooms and they were really, I mean, the space was really lovely. 
And I also learned that a lot of the apartments themselves, the units themselves, it's the the quality of like, you know, just the countertops and everything is something that APA you have, like you have like a a set kind of, I don't know what the right word is, but standard. Um, standard yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That's the word. Thank you. You got to jump in and help me there. Yes. And, um, and I really thought it was, it was very lovely and, um, and having so many of these, of these units, it's really for families. So thank you for answering that question. Um, I have, uh, there's more questions here, Ron, wondering whether there are minimum and maximum size requirements for an economical project. And number two is, is it difficult to include retail in the projects? I'm very, I, I, and if um, and if you want clarity, you could answer it the way Ron has asked it, but I am very interested in that second question, which is retail and, uh, and what does it mean and how do you bring in retail? I mean, just for us, I've heard from our own community on Connecticut Avenue, we really value small businesses, you know, locally owned. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of entrepreneurs all over and, we have a lot of people who are doing really good work and we want to attract, you know, small businesses and not the big retail boxes. So can you um, share with us your experience? Yeah, Mitch, why don't you start? Sure. Yeah. So I think in terms of retail, um, we, we, we also like to put retail in buildings where it makes sense, you know, if it's on a commercial corridor or, you know, in an area that, that has a lot of foot traffic um, or we can provide maybe like a more services oriented uh, commercial user that would help the neighborhood, all that's good. I think it's it's hard to finance. It's hard for us to structure that because there's not as many sources of funding for us to use for the retail space as there are for affordable housing. You know, we talked about the low income housing tax credit, but you can't use any of that money for the retail. And a lot of the uh, gap funding from cities and counties also is not for retail. Um, and then if we agree, we also wanna have local businesses involved but it's harder to underwrite debt for them because right, the bank doesn't know that they're gonna last to, for the full term of the loan. So it's just a harder nut to crack, but we've certainly done it. Um, and the, the building in, that's the background of Carmen, that has the church, that's a you know considered a commercial tenant. And then the La Cocina VA is another commercial tenant. And then at the project we're doing in Fort Totten, we'll have 9,000 square feet uh, for a commercial user as well. So we definitely do it. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the, do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. Okay. Please, please. In terms of the size question, I think our kind of minimum is somewhere around 80 units. And that's just because any smaller than that and the, the economics just sort of break down the, the kind of, there's a, there's a lot of fixed costs, right? To, to put the, the housing up and you can't quite make the deal work if it's smaller than that. And then on the upper end, that really comes down to the, the site, the zoning, you know, how, how tall can we build under the zoning? How tall makes sense for the co community context? Um, and then what construction type is it? It get, you know, the taller you go, the more expensive the, the, the hard costs are. Um, and also it comes down to kind of what is the funding available? So if a county has a lot of funding, like DC is putting 500 million in the budget this year, it hasn't passed yet, but it's proposed. If they are really putting that commitment behind it, we can go as large as the site will allow. Um, and but if there's not as much gap funding available, then we're kind of a little bit more constrained in what we can do. Um, so I think I think I would say it's the zoning, the site, and then also again, I want to reiterate the community context. We don't put great tall buildings in places that where no other building around them is is super tall. We want to be respectful to the communities we're entering. That's that's. And I, think I want to also art. take yeah. a. Yeah. Moment on the retail component and ways that we kind of identify the pain points of our development partners if they happen to identify a retailer, um, especially a small business. So some of the things that we're doing on our newer projects, if our development partner have identified um, local small businesses, what we will in include in our design contract is discounted design fees, because I think people don't understand it's one thing for a small business to get a brick and mortar space. But can they design that space in a way and, and afford those costs to create a space that it's elevated with the community, especially if you're ta targeting a true local and small business owner. Um, another thing that we're doing, um, not in the DC area, but we are looking for other innovative ways to create a retail space and what that means. Um, we just did a community exercise with the organization in Philadelphia. It's called Farmer John, J-A-W-N. Um, and it is about community supported agriculture. So what they're doing in the ground floor retail bay, right? What they created this open air kind of um, agriculture garden, fresh fruit produce, 
-hmm. And then it's community supported agriculture where they employ local farmers um, to then come in, farm the community, the CSA, and then the residents of that community buy into the CA, CSA. And it's legit really farm to table. And when we talk about, um, you know, people who live in affordable housing, the average farmer in the US can make a salary of 55 to $65,000 a year, right? So when you think about retail differently, instead of just getting a soul cycle, Lululemon or Orange Theory, how can you create, and I go to all those things, no shade. Um, <laughs> how, can get, how can you get a retail component that's really about cultivating what's in a community and rethinking what retail actually means um, and how you really incorporate the small business component of that. That was invaluable. Thank you so much, Kia. It's really a food for thought there, uh, for sure. I want to read one comment that someone made. So it's in the Q&A, but I think it's important to read comments. And so um, Lucy said, my only problem, this is earlier, this is not, this comment didn't come in right now. My only problem is that the buildings look like factories. I feel like, uh, I feel that the look should reflect nature and that the flat roofs, et cetera, don't, fit, do not enhance the environment, texture and material should enhance the environment, they look dense and squat. So, you know, people really do care about this, you know, obviously. Um, and then let me read another question. Uh, Jamie, what are the components of a housing RFP request for proposal that make it attractive for you to bid on an item or bid on item, bid on it? Um, I'm who, happy who wants to, to answer this. That? Yeah, okay. I'm happy to, to answer this. I think for us, we are really careful about who we partner with. We want there to be an alignment of values. So when someone puts out an RFP, if it's a church, if it's a municipality, we're reading really carefully, what are they looking for here? Do they just care about who's gonna pay the most money to ground lease the dirt or you know, cut the biggest check? That'll never be us. Or are they really looking to partner in terms of creative affordable housing solutions a deeply community-based, resident-led model? Are they open to innovation? Because that's where I, you know, we have precedent examples of, you know, partnerships we've done in the region that show that does, I don't care if it's going to take us seven years to get a project done. Once we're in, we're in, right? We care about fulfilling our commitments to our community and to our partners. But that, that's a two-way commitment. I'm looking to partner with people that aren't gonna change their mind because they got some pushback around doing something. That's, those are the sort of projects that we're attracted to is, is you know, a very committed um, you know, municipality, church. Right. Do, you want to, um, do you want to address that same question? Uh, Kia, would you like to add anything now? Oh, no, I was just agreeing with Carmen. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me, uh, Commissioner Gosselin, Commissioner Cadwell, do you want to ask a question? You've been sitting there so quietly. It's, uh, and so unusually quiet. Um, <laughs> um, so um, it, this is inspiring. Um, uh, uh, Kia, like, can get me <laughs> crank, crank, cranked up pretty fast. Um, uh, Connie, uh, Chaz, and I sit on the local uh, advisory neighborhood commission, and we face a pretty monumental task. And, and in a very short time frame, we have before us a draft plan, small area plan for our our commercial, our main street. Um, when we we asked, the, our predecessor commission asked for this. Uh, and when uh, our predecessor commission asked for this, they expressed substantial, they expressed a, 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 an interest in doing affordable housing, but substantial skepticism about the tools that the city has used, so-called inclusionary zoning or, uh, uh, or IZ or IZ plus. And they, the, our predecessor asked for ideas about how to find more creative solutions. Um, to my way of thinking, the, um, the draft plan we have before us does not offer that. And uh, I am scrambling to try to find suggestions for how we might 
uh, put that into a resolution that changes or asks for modifications in the small area plan. Now, uh, um, one idea I have, and I guess to Carmen, I'm, I'm interested in whether this would um, do any good or, or you would consider this, right? So uh, it, basically the notion of a procedural tilt to um, nonprofit developers, uh, uh, community land trusts and so forth that, that um, something like um, kind of sort of a community opportunity to purchase act for, for you know, that, that, that if, a, if a property comes up, if a development pro uh, proposal comes in, say from a for-profit developer, sites up for development, you know, um, uh, we, would, we would include a provision that says, uh, 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 if, if, a, if a community, if, if an, uh, a nonprofit uh, uh, affordable housing developer comes forward, they will have, you name the period of time, you know, four months to see if they can assemble a team and a financing to do it. I, I offer this just as one example. If you can give me other examples, I think this ANC is interested in doing affordable housing and not doing affordable housing um, or supplementing the tools the city has used today. Um, so uh, if you have other uh, uh, approaches, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I mean, I think in the RFP stating priorities around innovation and home ownership as a component would, you know, I would list it as one of your objectives and use it and as a scoring criteria because people are, some people are going to really lean into it and you know, go out of their way in their proposal if they really want to partner with you and be responsive to your goals. But it's important to give flexibility because then a mistake you can make is say you absolutely want it and you know it's never really been done and you're going to get someone to say, of course I'll do it. And they really haven't figured it all out in four months because it's yeah. never been done, right? So you're going to have someone who just wants to win, who gets picked and it's never going to happen. And then you're going to lose yeah. four, five years picking the wrong person. You're better off saying what you want and then pick, pick a partner has credibility, demonstrating that they can meet goals of a community and of a, of a partner that's making the solicitation. Okay, and one other question. Um, are there any examples of where you have done a development in a community uh, where you feel your both the residents of your building need uh, supportive services, but as it turns out, so do so do <laughs> so does the community, or so do buildings nearby, where you have used your your ability to deliver these services beyond your building. Absolutely. So um, you know, one of the things we're doing now is you know we have food delivery from a local food pantry. Um, for groceries for, for a week, come to several of our properties. Well, there are people in the broader Boston area that, that don't have a landlord that set that up. They don't have a community room. And we said, well, why can't they come in our building? Um, and, you know, we have security. We, we Apple's like Fort Knox. There's a lot of security to get into our buildings for a reason. We want it to be safe. But we created a system so now we can welcome those residents who are part of the food assistance program into our building. And then certainly vaccination clinics, we would advertise not just for our building, it could be for anyone who needs a vaccine. So, you know, there's some things that are just for the property, especially like after school tutoring and other things for safety reasons for, you know, young children, we wanna make sure we control access, but many, many of our events are open. Yeah, and I see- Thank you. I see, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just see the thought follow up question here about what you said, Peter, about this kind of community opportunity to purchase act. Um, and Ronald is just asking to clarify if we think that's feasible. Um, and I mean, that's a great idea, right? Because one of the things that really is hard for us is that properties move so fast and they want a certain price or they want all cash offer, they can't be patient. Will we go and assemble the funding that we need in order to close the deal? So something that would interrupt the, that process and allow us to come in certainly would solve a lot of the problems that we have. Um, but I think it's probably politically extremely difficult to realize something like that. I mean, the TOPA is already, you know, 
so hated by the many members of the development community because it is an interference in the kind of transactional process of, of real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the sort of saving grace of Topa, right, is that there are people living on site in, apart in the apartments that are affected by the sale. Whereas if you're talking about just all commercial, you know, all property being sold, I would think I would want you, I would suggest thinking through the political viability of that. Um, <laughs> but it certainly, so I like I said, it solves a lot of the issues that we deal with. So I want to jump in and, and read out the question that Mitch was just responding to for the people who are going to watch the video recording. So Ron um, said at Carmen to Carmen, Mr. Gosselin was asking a different question. If there is no RFP, but a private development proposal for a private site, is there a way for a nonprofit developer to step in and replace that private developer? And that is what Mitch was responding to. Just I want to be cognizant, mindful. And, and, and Ron's interpretation of the question is a correct one. Um, is, is it, is, that is to say, I'm asking about private sites, and I'm wondering if a, a procedural thing. It doesn't give you you got to you got to meet the you got to meet and beat the private proposal. But if you were given a if you were given a, a tilt, a procedural tilt of a time period, would that would that help you or wouldn't it? Um, and uh, uh, Mitch, to your point, I, I absolutely understand it's a difficult uh, mountain to climb. Um, I guess I, I I wonder whether, I mean, my other, and this, I'm, look, I'm just blue skying this stuff, but I mean, you know, I wonder whether it would be any more, whether one could think about extending TOPA, which is all residential now, TOPA in DC, uh, to commercial so that you know i mean this this community has shown in the year plus that we've been doing this small area planning process that it loves the fact that a lot of our um, local businesses are just that really local there's a very very wonderful i mean hold it somebody said that uh, mitch you said did you uh bought your toys at child's play if you buy them today they will be wrapped in the very same wrapping paper that you got when you were a kid <laughs> that's up um the owner uh, uh of of child's play lives 300 feet from the store right maybe 400 300 something like that right so there's a huge love of these businesses and the question is is there a way that's a, there's a, and another question is how do you realistically provide some not total but some protection so that these businesses could be in a revamped um, main street so um, if you have any ideas on that uh, I'm happy well, to hear those too. I mean something that some other cities have done is to they intervene and then put out an RFP so I worked on a project in San Francisco where the city bought there was a parcel of land up for sale that had been entitled as a market rate project. The city recognized that there was a ton of gentrification and displacement happening in the neighborhood. They came and bought the site at the list price and then put out an RFP for affordable developers to build it. My company won and we built 81 units. So the city always has a right to do that and, and, and has the resources more so, right? Even if there's not a regulatory mechanism like you're talking about. And they also they do have eminent domain also available, which is like a boogeyman word, but um, it would achieve the same the same effect you're talking about. And I love hearing that about child's play. I'll have to go back. Have <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Chaz, why don't you go? You had your hand up, and then um, I will I will um, read out some more questions from the audience. Sure, thank you. Yeah, no, I had um, two questions. One is um, one of the concerns that people have had over this last year here is the impact of any development on parking. And if you add parking to one of your projects, does that blow the economics completely? Or um, how do you integrate that in, into a neighborhood you're, you're working in? We build parking um, in all of our buildings. I don't think we've done a single, you know, parking free one yet. And even in Arlington, um, we're, we're not doing that. It's in our ratio across the portfolio is around 0.7 parking spaces per unit. Um, but, and that's, that's our usage. So we, we count mm -hmm. at night, we go to our parking garages at midnight and see how many empty spots we have. And since we have 20 properties in the area, we get a sense for what's the profile of the people living in our buildings and what the usage is. And we've now got enough data to do that. And then we also do studies, 
but it is a cost. Every parking spot's like $50,000 a space. So we have to be judicious. So if you're right next to the Metro, and in this case, you're, you know, you're not right in your area, um, it's one formula. So we really do use proximity to, to rail and, you know, proximity to buses that are, you know, operating in a high functioning and don't have a one size fits all. Right. And one of the concerns was this is a community that's older than much of the city by some real margin. And so people don't have the mobility to you know, get to the metro or clamber up onto the bus always um, or, to, or to walk from wherever the bus stops. Um, but my other question is, you've got a great story and it looks like a great operation. Um, are there three other firms like you that are competitive that we would be just as happy to, to know about? <laughs> Of, of course, yes. We're not the only game in town. I think we're very blessed to live in a region where there are other mm -hmm. profits doing great work. So, um, you know, if you want names of other people to to make sure you talk to, I'm happy to do that because no, no, I, I, I'm just I, it's it's you're doing a difficult thing. So it's not something that everybody's going to jump up to do. But well, to reframe, I, but yeah. So to reframe that question. Do they do what you do on the residential services? Um, you know, a couple of us do. Um, I'd say that that is, you know, I'd, there's probably two or three that I think are of the same mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but I think this is where um, we work with a lot of developers in the district right. and other market segments, right? But, you know, um, Connie, the piece you just asked about the residence of service component piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are the things that we get to hear when we're installing furniture, right? From other developers who might have resident services. This is too nice for these people. And this is after we had did a whole spiel about equity and elevating. But then if the resident service people have an expectation of that community, so just because a development shop might have resident services, what is the integrity of that staff, of that team? And I can say, because I engage with the resident service and the property managed teams. Yeah, there are other shops that do what APA do, but not with the same level of integrity and empathy and dialogue towards the community. That is what I can honestly say. And what we talk about as a team and the type of development partners we want to do business with that sets APA apart from other other developments in the district. In the district. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, Alan has a question. Charles, I can come back to you if you have a, another no, question. But Alan, okay, Alan has a question. What is the approximate ratio of capital sourced for APA projects, i.e., municipal, federal, program, philanthropic, at all? Okay, Mitch. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's to you. <laughs> so it's like Hollywood it really, squares. <laughs> it really depends on the project. Um, so let me start. I'll kind of go through each source. So the first thing we put on our project is just like any development is per, a conventional debt. So just a mortgage, just like you get a mortgage for your house, we get a mortgage for the apartment building, and we you underwrite your own mortgage based on your own personal household income. We underwrite the mortgage based on the income that the rents minus the expenses will generate. Whereas a market rate project would have a lot of debt. That would be a big percentage of their um, capital stack because they have you know, a lot of cash flowing from it. For us, the rents are quite low because it's affordable, but the expenses are just as high as any other market rate project, right? We still have to pay janitors, electricity, you know, um, all those same things. It costs the same, no matter what kind of project you're running. Um, and so therefore our cash flow is lower and therefore the permanent debt we can get is a lot lower. So as a percent of the capital stack, it's, it's a minority. Then the, the second source is the low income housing tax credit. So that's equity. And I've seen that be like around 40% of the total of the total capital stack. So it, again, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, and that's a, an investment from a bank or um, someone with a high tax liability. And then in exchange, they get credits and they get tax benefits from the real estate. Um, so then from there, those are kind of the, the, two, the, the two starting points for every project. And then we start to get into the gap funding. So you know, you, you get those two sources, then you have your total expenses, and then you got to fill the gap. So we first look to the city or county that we're in. To, so that's like where the DC Housing Production Trust Fund comes in. Um, and every city and county has a different metric that they use for how much they're willing to pay. You know, they might have a ratio, like 
one of their dollars, like Loudoun County does one of their dollars for every $5 you get from other sources. Mm -hmm. Or other people might have a kind of a per unit target, maybe between 30 and 75,000 per unit they might wanna target, et cetera. So that might be another portion of your capital stack. Then we'll look to other state sources. So in Virginia, in addition to whatever we can get from the county, we would look to the Virginia Housing Trust Fund or um, the National Housing Trust Fund, um, home, you've probably heard of home money and CDBG, community development block grants. Um, mm -hmm. Those are all kind of other state sources that help fill that gap. Um, and then you, so that's kind of the municipal federal. Um, and then philanthropic is, is rare for affordable housing mm -hmm. developments. It's increasingly, you know, coming into the picture as a lot of private companies are kind of waking up to the fact that, you know, it, it's good for them to invest in affordable housing in their communities where they operate. So we're seeing that more and more. And uh, some of our projects we've done like capital campaigns, like the Triboliga project, we did that. But usually um, that's not a huge percentage of the stack. I hope that helps. Right. So for that project that you were just talking about, Mitch, um, the American Legion one, which is the Tour Liger one, I can never pronounce it. I'm so sorry. I really still can't pronounce that name. Um, that person did invest. I, I don't know if it was a million or two million. It was some significant amount, correct? And this is why you've yeah. named that building, right, for that largest investor, correct? And he's a private yeah. citizen. Is that is that true? Right. Okay. He um, grew up in Arlington. He donated a million and a half to name it after his parents. So that was the first time we did a four million dollar mm. campaign. Amazon gave a million. Mr. Twiller gave a million and a half. But corporations, mm. since it was veterans focused, you had a lot of contractors. Defense contractors interested in doing something nice. Oh, okay. Finish line. That's great. That's wonderful. Okay, but that was one of the first times you've done it that way. Right. That kind of a fundraiser. Okay, that's a very yeah. that's a very Tip excellent yeah. idea. Okay. Typically, we use philanth uh, philanthropic money more for the service side, not the capital side. Okay, got it. Okay, one more question from anonymous. Oakwood is on public land. Do you also build projects on privately owned land? Given the high land costs in Chevy Chase, would it be an inviting place for Appa to build? It's a good question. Yeah, so um, we definitely, yes, we build land on both public and private land. We, we kind of get projects through a variety of means. One is the kind of our, this, a, a county or city or state owns land, they do an RFP, we bid on it. But we also work with brokers, just like a, a market rate developer would. And we have several projects where we've just gone out and put in an LOI to a broker and, you know, won the land that way. Um, and then there's other ways we get land too. And then your question about the high land cost in Chevy Chase, um, it, it is, it, it does make it more difficult, certainly. Um, it's also the size of parcel that we would need that is the biggest challenge probably for your neighborhood. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just, you know, it's a lot of single family homes and then the commercial corridor, right? So there's not as many large parcels that can get to that 80 unit number we've talked about at a density that's appropriate for the, for the area. But that's where, you know, like the Lord and Taylor site where I got my first suit, um, you know, that, that's, that's where, I mean, everyone is talking about using at least a portion of that for affordable housing. That's a great big site that's just sitting there empty. That would be a great one for development. Um, I always say, yeah. So what, 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 is a, what is a minimum lot size for an 80 unit uh, development? Just well, it depends, on the, it depends on the density, right? So if, if we're building a eight story building, we could do it on, you know, like a third of an acre. But if we're, if we want to, it depends on the, so it, it's hard to say, uh, you know, if we want to be, if the context is four, five, six stories, then we're going to need more like an acre or larger to kind of get to that number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we are at the hour. This is the witching hour. I'd like to end pretty soon. So I'm going to give each of the panelists a time to wrap it up, say whatever you want to say, parting words, and then I'm going to thank you a lot for being here with us tonight. So anyone want to go first? Yeah, I can just go first so that, um, all the pros, all the wonderful other people here get the last word. I just want to say that, you know, it's so meaningful to me to be talking to people from my like really micro neighborhood. And it's been, you know, when I got into this work, it was, I wanted to build housing where I grew up, you know, like in DC, in Maryland, and in Virginia. Um, and so I really hope to be able to do a project in Chevy Chase one day. Um, and, and then I can really say, you know, I'm from here, right? Like I'm, I grew up here and I'm building housing for people that need it in my community. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you.
Oh, I'll go next so that Kia can close down <laughs> the house with her amazing uh, knowledge and wit. But, you know, I'm just honored that you invited us here. You know, we do a lot of presentations and discussions with the community, but this was a really special um, evening. And I, I'm really so pleased that we just met you two weeks ago, Connie, and you immediately said, hey, we have this like learning series that we're doing and invited us um, to the table. And then you said, and there's this other woman that talks about that, and I'm like, and Kia and our Kia together, all of us one that, and that the fact that it just all kind of came together so naturally, and that you had a chance to visit Twilliger um, recently, just shows to me how much thought and care is going into this community conversation, which is really the start of what's going to make it work, right? People are invested in this. You know, you've got people devoting their evenings to really unpacking the challenges the opportunity. And so we're just honored to be part of the conversation. So thank you for inviting us. I'm gonna echo that, Carmen. I think in the, in the role that I play, one of the biggest soft costs on a development project, um, to, be a part, to, be, to be a part of the conversation this early and for you all as a community to be looking at it from an equitable design lens, I think you're doing something right. Um, and that way the outcome does not become an afterthought, but it has a lot more intentionality to reach more and to serve more and to connect um, the story of everyone who, who exists within this space um, and to get to do it. I think the serendipity of it already being with a partner that we work with, um, that's how I know like timing is everything. So I'm just humbled and really grateful to be a part of this dialogue and this conversation. Well, we are so happy that you joined us. You know, evenings are so important. I mean, we all have lives outside of our work, but this is such important work for our community. So I appreciate the time that you spent. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to stop the recording um, because I have to copy and paste the chat and everything. I have to make sure I've got it all right. And you're so going to send I can it to me, share right? It. I will send, yes, Randy will send you the, he'll send you the video recording and I'm going to do my part. So everyone who stayed with us, thank you so much and, um, and stay tuned. There may be more sessions to come. We'll see if I can get it together, if we can get it together. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to stop so recording. Thank you. Okay. All thank right. You don't go though. This don't, go. don't leave. I'm going to stop the recording, but don't leave yet because I hate these abrupt departures. It, it's it, like, I, I don't like it. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs>